thank you very much, uh, Fran Francesco. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here back to the to the ESRB um, and um, to chair the session. And you will in a, in a second you will also see all the panelists in the in the session on international perspectives of macroprudential um, policy. How do I have a? Ah, okay. Okay, so let me um, let me just give you a very quick um, um, overview of where I think uh, the, the discussion is in terms of international uh, uh, coordination or perspectives of macroprudential policy. But then we actually have a great panel to talk about these issues, so I won't um, take um, too much of um, of our, our time this this morning. Um, so where I think that international coordination or the international dimension of macroprudential uh, uh, policy comes in is whenever we talk about spillovers, and the, the panelists will also um, pick this up, and, and now spillovers um, in and of itself is, is, a, is a neutral term for, for me. So we can have um, cross-border transmission of policies, of, of shocks and, and spillovers, and those can be a sign that markets are integrated. So we would naturally expect that um, if we implement policies in one country or if there are shocks in one country, that that has effects on, on others. But spillovers can also be a sign of contagion of shocks. And I think the challenge that we're all facing is to identify what types of spillovers are we, are we, are we dealing with dealing with and also getting a good um, classification um, of these spillovers. So do we have externalities? And um, I think Philippe Baquetta will also argue there can be positive externalities. So also externalities, usually it has a somewhat of a negative connotation, but there can also be um, uh, positive externalities. And that, of course, give rise to the, to the issue, should we coordinate um, uh, our policies across borders? And I think one reason why it's, it's good to be here and good to be here in the ESRB context is that I think the ESRB is actually also a template for, for um, international policy coordination. Maybe we'll find out that what we're doing is too complicated in terms of coordination. I will also show you a slide related to the procedures that we're actually implementing. Um, but I think it's at, at least a model that we have, and I think also some of the international discussions would benefit from looking at what the, um, what the ESRB is doing. Um, but I think, and this is also where we will get into this discussion, um, really what's important is to have good analytical tools to look at um, uh, spillovers, externalities, however you want to call them, and um, the tools that we have to actually identify whether we have um, externalities. Let me skip over this slide, which is just trying to define a bit what I think is, is a useful way of thinking in, uh, about policy making in general, namely to have a structured policy cycle. I think we need to be very structured, and Francesco has just mentioned this, um, that whenever we, we um, um, uh, activate some, some policy, some policy instruments, we have to make sure that we actually know why, what's the policy objective, what are, what are indicators we are, we are um, looking at, um, and then we are activating instruments, and of course, in the end, we have to look at what we have actually done and whether we've accomplished uh, what we were trying to, to do. So this is just to give you a little bit of my, my mindset and our mindset also in the, in the Bundesbank, how we should, in a very structured way, um, look, at, um, look at policies. So once we have done this, once we have really identified the need for policy intervention and also the, the, the degree and the, and the scope of it, we, of course, have to ask ourselves, well, what's the, what's the type of policy coordination we may need? So do we follow this policy cycle that I've just very briefly have described? Do we follow this only at a national level, or do we coordinate with other policy areas? And obviously, in particular in this building, there's also an interesting discussion generally in, in central banks to what extent uh, should we coordinate monetary policy and macroprudential policy, and um, uh, I would argue the the more effective the risk-taking channel is of monetary policy, the more there is a need of macroprudential policy also to react maybe to monetary policy. And also the effectiveness of macroprudential policies obviously pl plays an important role. I mean, without violating the mandates of each policy area, but these two things um, have implications for the, for the interaction between monetary policy and macroprudential policy. Um, 
Maybe in the discussion we'll also come to the, the interaction, which I think is very important in particular when we talk about counter-cyclical policies, the coordination between micro-pro and, and macro-pro. Um, all of us who are engaged in these discussions know how difficult it can be sometimes to bring the macro perspective into prudential policy, which has a very different perspective. At the same time, it's interesting and, and, and challenging. Um, but I think what's the purpose of, of this particular session is to uh, really talk about the coordination of macroprudential policies across borders. And as I've argued, um, we, we're doing this coordination um, already in, in Europe with the ESRB, with the Financial Stability Committee of the, of the ECB. And I think it's interesting to look at how this coordination works and what can potentially um, be, be learned. And everybody who's, who's in the process knows that we can always learn. But but um, uh, we have to we have to start at some point, and I think this is what we are um, what we are doing right now. Um, so, and maybe at some future point in time, we will also use this as a template for coordination at a more international level. There are discussions about this. The BIS has started discussions about um, macroprudential policy coordination in an international context. I don't think we are there yet. Maybe we never want to be at the stage that we have a global <laughs> ESRB, uh, which is, I mean, the ESRB in and of itself is already challenging. Um, but I think we can learn um, from the experience um, that we are currently uh, that we are currently having. Um, so very briefly, um, what what is happening in, in Europe? Most of you in the room probably are very much aware of the of the um, ESRB work and the um, macroprudential policies. Um, this is taken from the ESRB database, which is, I think, a very important point that we need good data on, on macroprudential policies and, um, and uh, their, their actual implementation. And what you see here is that more and more countries are using macroprudential policies. So this is uh, just a, um, the, the, the number of countries initiating some measures is has been increasing over time. This is comparing 2014 to 2016. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a rather um, refined methodology of applying also these measures in a reciprocal way across countries that has been briefly mentioned by Francesco. I don't go into the details here. But this is just to say there are policies being interacted. There is some coordination. And of course, the question is, um, is this effective? How can the process be Im improved? Um, and so on. Um, this is just one example, the, the Estonian systemic risk buffer and how it's been applied across countries, um, which countries uh, followed the, the request for reciprocation and which, um, which did not. Um, so just very briefly, um, one of the, the analytical approaches I think that we can, we can take to look at, and now I'm coming to the part of policy effectiveness and actually effects on, on um, lending and on other measures potentially risk. Um, the example is the International Banking Research Network that I've been running together with Linda Goldberg from the, from the New York Fed and with many, many countries, probably also many representatives of these countries are in the room here, um, where we're looking at basically policy spillovers and we use the micro data that are available in the individual central banks to look at um, policy spillovers. Um, We've done a number of things in terms of um, spillovers of liquidity risk of um, unconventional monetary policy and the cross-border effects of macroprudential policies. And I just want to give you, with one slide, an overview of um, what we found in this study, which is really, again, trying to do the the fourth step in my policy cycle, namely to assess what the effects of policies actually are. And what we find here is that um, Yes, we do have um, spillovers of, uh, of prudential policies. So we actually look at microprudential and macroprudential policies. Um, so, but it's it's hard to tell the one story how these um, um, instruments spill spill over. So there's differences across countries, um, across types of banks, um, by, by bank business models, by uh, differences um, according to the prudential instrument we're, we're looking at. And maybe that's good news. Maybe it's, it's, it's actually a stabilizing feature that not all the countries, all the banks react in exactly the same way to the same type of policy instrument. But of course, it makes it difficult to also to draw a general con conclusion in terms of what are spillovers? Are they always po positive or negative? 
I should also say that in this project we don't distinguish between, we, try, we don't try to identify externalities and, and uh, we just take a very agnostic approach here. What is important is that um, there's market share repositioning, um, so the, the, obviously the, the, the stronger banks find it easier to deal with a tightening of prudential, um, uh, prudential instruments. Um, and overall, the international spillovers, um, we look at the effects on loan growth, are not very large. So it's not that this is the dominating effect uh, driving, um, driving um, loan growth. Um, but there's also lots of other things we don't look at in this, in this project, and maybe that's why we're here to also define a little bit the agenda um, going forward. Um, so with that, let me, let me just um, um, close and, and say what I think are the, the questions that maybe we can, we can take a next step towards answering this, this morning in this, in this session. Um, the first is, I think there's a lot of analytical issues that we still have to deal with if we want to look at um, policy coordination, policy spillovers. Um, the results that I've just shown to you are basically drawn from um, microeconometric um, studies um, trying to do as good as we can a proper identification of policy effects. And that, of course, means that we have to be very specific with regard to the micro um, um, level effects. Um, now, usually what we're interested in when we look at macroprudential policy and financial stability are the aggregate effects. And so I, I think Kal Kalemni will have part of the answer of how we can go from the micro to the, to the macro. Um, so let me, for, for the analytical part, maybe stop here. Uh, data are crucial, so that's what we learned in the, in the project, that it's not always easy to get the right data on activities, on the prudential um, measures. So in that sense, it's very welcome that the IMF and also the ESRB have uh, data sets on this. Um, and then are a number of other um, uh, and other issues when it comes to cross-border um, uh, co collaboration. Uh, one is, as I've outlined here, the analytical approaches. The second is, um, do we have a good overview of the of the of the studies that have actually been uh, been done? And the third is, and I think this is also a bit the purpose of this of this meeting here. I think we have to um, have a much more intensive dialogue between policymakers and academia, asking for the policymakers to to define the questions, and also for the for academia to tell us what can be, con what are the answers we can potentially get from. Um, from academia and from the theoretical and empirical work. So with that, let me, let me um, close my, my um, introductory remarks and uh, um, ask the, the, the panelists to actually join me here on the, on the panel. I think we can all be up here and then uh, take it in, in, in turns. Um, we will have uh, Philippe Baquetta from the University of Lausanne. And now getting ready for this, I was trying to uh, find out what is H-E-C Lausanne, I should have checked that before, but the, yeah, yeah. I should, I should, I should say it, I, okay, okay. <laughs> and um, so he will tackle the issues um, that are just um, lined out more from a theoretical per per perspective, I, if, I, if I classify you a little bit. Um, then we have Shepnam Kalemni Ershan from the University of Maryland, um, who will, who will um, talk about more the empirical aspects um, of it. And then Jeff Franks from the International Monetary Fund, who's in charge of the European office here, um, and uh, uh, will, I guess, say a little bit more about the, the policy aspects of it. But we're just looking forward to, to um, uh, the presentations of all three of you. You each have uh, 15 minutes. Um, Philippe will start, and then we should also have sufficient time for discussion here in this group. So thank you very much for, for being with us, and Philippe would, would start. Okay, so I thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, uh, give some thoughts about uh, this issue of uh, international dimensions of macro prudential. So I'm an international macroeconomist and more uh, on the theory side, so my perspective will be uh, uh, very, uh, say, theoretically oriented and probably much more abstract than uh, everything else that uh, you might uh, uh, talk about. Um, so, <clears throat> well, in the international dimension in the macro, uh, in the open economy, uh, macro prudential is particularly useful because it helps uh, um, stabilizing the economy w when you get external pressure, especially when a monetary policy uh, can, is, not, is not enough. On the other hand, 
macroprudential become uh, macro pro become more difficult in the open economy. So I'm going to rely on the existing literature and give a few thoughts about, uh, related to this literature. I'm not going to do a, a, a whole, whole survey, but um, 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 still there are, there are some uh, interesting, interesting aspects. Now, the, uh, I would say the shortcoming is that this literature is very small. Now, the issue of macro pro is, is new. At the macro level, it's also something new. For people have started to think about uh, macro prudential in a closed economy, and now they are starting to think about the open economy. So uh, this is uh, uh, something, it's a very young uh, literature. Uh, the insights are, are, are limited, and I'm going to uh, explain a little bit about that. Now, one uh, question that people ask is, uh, is it useful to coordinate macro prudential policies? In my view, this is too early to answer this question. There are too many aspects that we need to, to understand to give the answer uh, uh, yes or no. Some people say, oh, there are strong gains for, for cooperation. Others say, no, no, it's too difficult uh, to cooperate. Some countries will, will not gain. So I refer to an interesting paper, review paper by Agenor and Pereira da Silva at the BIS, where they give an overview of all these issues. I'm not going to talk about that. Still, there is the fundamental question, which is to know what are, what are the, sp the international spillovers and what are the externalities. Uh, if you need to coordinate, it means that national macro is either they do either too much or too little. And I think that's uh, the, the question. In other words, are the international externalities positive or negative? Uh, talking about externalities, what should distinguish in the closed economy? Uh, it is basically externalities that justify ma typically macroprudential, but uh, uh, these are pecuniary or demand externalities. But what we care about at the international context is whether there is also an international dimension to these externalities. And I think the literature uh, uh, is trying to understand what are these externalities. Uh, what are the different spillovers, and different papers go in different directions, and this is where the, the work uh, uh, has to be done that, so that we really uh, uh, understand that. And uh, uh, there, there, uh, there are different, different uh, uh, directions. The, in, intuitively, you would think that the externality is positive because if macro pro can reduce uh, systemic risk in one country, then this is good for the other countries. So this is a, a positive spillover. It means that when the country takes its own decision, it does not take into account uh, the positive effect on the other countries, and then it, it, should, it should do more of it. So uh, that would be, say that there, there may be uh, uh, too, too, too little. But then there are some uh, various papers in the literature that show that you could also have too much of it. And let me give you uh, an example that I think is interesting and is also representative of what is being done in, in the literature. So there's a, I found three papers at least that uh, have, this, uh, have this result, Fanaro Rome, Jean, and Akari and Bengi, uh, where they find that um, macro uh, prudential may be excessive in a liquidity trap. Why? Because a liquidity trap is typically caused by a situation of excess savings over investment. There's too much net saving, for example, because of strong deleveraging. <coughs> and now, in a liquidity trap, in a global uh, saving glut, if you want, if you have uh, countries that start to do aggressive uh, macro prudential, uh, they will actually basically reduce even more, leverage even more. So they will reduce net saving in even more. So in this paper, they show that uh, such a macro pro will have a kind of a global general equilibrium effect that will even put more pressure on the interest rate and maybe even delay could delay the, the exit of uh, the, the zero lower bound and can have uh, uh, negative implications. So in that case, they show that this macro pro can be, can be excessive. There are other examples where of uh, excessive ma macro pro. So if advanced economies increase their regulations, this uh, uh, push capital towards uh, emerging markets uh, that uh, may, be, may be booming, they may get excessive capital flows. So this would be another uh, negative e externality. 
Now, these effects are quite interesting. These are general equilibrium effects, but they rely on one assumption, which is that uh, macro pro is very powerful and uh, impacts uh, the whole economy. And we heard yesterday, and I, well, of course, you all, all know that more, uh, probably more than I, I do, uh, but we heard like, uh, Mario Draghi, Philippe Lane, talking about leakages, talking about the fact that only some part of the economy are um, uh, affected by, by uh, macro pro. So the macro pro that is analyzed in international macro model may be too powerful compared to what we find in, in the data. In particular, well, there are two types of, of leakages that uh, are, are obvious, but we would see we are not uh, uh, considered. Is the fact that in many cases, macro pro only apply to residents, or macro pro only apply to banks, or both both of these. If it only applies to, to residents, of course there is a an arbitrage with. Uh, Foreign, uh, foreign lenders, and I think this, this, this is well known. There is nothing new I can, I can say about that, except advertising uh, an empirical paper I wrote. This is like a diversion from theory. Now, we documented the European firms, uh, uh, borrow, that risky European firms borrowed more from US, uh, from US uh, banks in 2007, 2008. Uh, we document that, and our uh, conjecture is that there may have been regulatory arbitrage because at that time uh, Basel II was applied at, in the European Union but uh, was not applied yet in the, in the US, so this risk-weighted uh, aspect was not yet present. So there, this, this is an example of, of regulatory arbitrage uh, where the European firms maybe lost some market share because uh, because of, of this of this difference, and this is the type of uh, thing that uh, we, we have in mind. If it's uh, if macro pool only goes to uh, the domestic uh, lenders, so this uh, measures macro pool for only domestic lenders. On the one hand, they make it can make them safer, but on the other hand, it make it increases competition. For these, for the domestic lenders, so there, there's a tension. So we can ask uh, whether there is a, a big impact on uh, or any impact on on systemic uh, risk. So this is one one aspect that uh, should be one type of leakage that should be taken into account into account in a um, in a um, macro uh, in international uh, macro setup. Of course, there are many, many details now that uh, well, you, you, you talk about uh, here in this, in this institution. The other uh, aspect is uh, that macro pro may only apply to banks, but we know that uh, now there's all uh, the, the non-banks, uh, co could be corporate bonds, uh, shadow banking, etc. So here in that case, uh, macro pro makes banks more resilient, but we are not sure whether uh, this reduces systemic risk. Actually, to me, this is a big question. Yesterday, there was some discussion about uh, counter-cyclical buffers. Does it uh, have an impact on, on, on uh, total borrowing, or is it just a buffer for, for the banks? And, and to me, it's, it's a, a, big, uh, a, a, a big issue. Now, these uh, leakages, either like uh, only banks, only residents, they have not been introduced, they have not been considered in the literature. And I think this is a big weakness, which is why, in my view, uh, it's a bit too early to, 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 draw, to draw conclusions. In the uh, international uh, uh, macro -pro literature, uh, I've not seen uh, uh, papers on, on that. I saw a paper, a recent paper uh, by Bengi and Bianchi, where they have macro pro with shadow banking, which is an interesting, it's an interesting paper. They find that in their setup, it is still uh, useful to have uh, regulation, and actually also that the level of regulation is not affected too much by shadow banking, because on the one hand, regulation becomes less effective; it only applies to uh, one part of, of uh, 
uh, the financial sector. But on the other hand, you uh, uh, have more risk from uh, the non-bank sector. So you have two, these two effects. May, uh, in the end, they, they kind of uh, offset each other. So the degree of uh, uh, regulation is, they find, is not so much affected by uh, shadow uh, uh, banking. But what we, we don't know is what are the uh, international spillovers of that? What are the implications for policy? For sure, if you can, can only have macro proof for banks, your, your policy is less effective to uh, uh, stabilize against uh, external uh, shocks. Hmm. Uh, so there are, I know several people who are working on these dimensions right now as, as I, I speak, but I've not seen any, any paper that, that deals uh, with this. Um, so I'd like to still make some, uh, some, some, uh, some comments in the, uh, thinking about, I don't know, about future work. I think the, this issue here about the, uh, uh, the banks, whether the macro proof has an effect on systemic risk or not, or whether it just makes banks resilient or not, something that I'd, I'd like to, to know from probably from empirical work, it's, uh, we, we don't know yet. I mean, this is, this is very early. We don't have enough uh, uh, history of, about that. Huh? So as a macroeconomist, I ask myself, no, is macro proof really macro? Uh, is it uh, banking sector proof only? Uh, I think this is, an, to me, it's an open question. But it's important to, if we start to understand uh, the, these international spillovers and externalities and the impact of macroprudential, it is important to, to know that, to know the answer to this question. Uh, is it just about uh, making the banks safer or does it have a, a, macro, uh, a macro effect? Um, now, in this uh, perspective, when you have leakages, uh, people, some uh, uh, people argue that you should focus on uh, borrowers. Uh, there's a paper by Jean and Corinek. If you could target directly households and firms, this would be uh, more, more effective than just targeting banks. Uh, there is a recent paper from the Bank of England by Ferrod et al. Uh, they look at uh, uh, loan-to-value ratio at uh, for, for firms and compare this with capital uh, ratios for banks. They find that the capital ratios for banks is no impact on the probability of crisis, uh, is not useful, while the LTV is very, very effective. And the reason is that in that case, they also have leakages, so uh, capital ratios uh, lead to more financing directly by households to, uh, to firms. So these are all issues that are interesting, should be explored, and then should be put into the international uh, context. In my last minute, I've give, let, my last thoughts are about uh, emerging markets, because here we really focus on uh, advanced economies. Now, in emerging markets, macro proof traditionally has been relatively easy because of uh, a limited capital mobility and a strong banking sector. But this, is, this has changed, or this is changing. There's more financial integration, there's disintermediation, so there's a, um, and the next, uh, Seb, Semnem will, will show us uh, uh, numbers about that. Uh, the emerging markets are borrowing more and more uh, outside of the banking, uh, the banking sector. Um, so this makes macro much more difficult in these, in these countries. Uh, one example is a recent paper by Anert et, et al, uh, where they look at the impact of FX regulations on banks in emerging markets, and they find that this is indeed effective for banks, but there is a spillover to the corporate sector, and firms actually then increase uh, their borrowing in foreign currency. So the total effect uh, is, is, is limited. So in that case, in this set of countries, uh, it sounds very difficult to, I would say, uh, fill the gaps between banks and non-banks. This is there is no ESRB in these in these countries, uh, and maybe uh, it's just simply easier to use capital controls for these other types of, of, uh, of capital flows. So uh, my time is up, I conclude. Uh, I think from uh, the international macro perspective, we are missing uh, these leakages. They should be introduced in, in models. We should try to understand that. And I th I'm sure we, we can make progress. I still see s challenges. Something that macro models will have difficulties with are gross positions. 
which are important, but typically in macro model, we talk about net, net positions. So all these issues of growth will uh, raise more difficulties. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Philippe. That was a very stimulating presentation, and I guess all of us, we have lots of uh, questions or, or just uh, comments for this discussion that, that we should, uh, could, could raise, but I suggest that we um, go on with Shepnam first and then um, uh, try to see the com commonalities but maybe also differences between the presentations. So you also want to stand up here? Uh, I have a microphone, but I oh, just okay. need, and I can just, oh, okay. Because I'm going to point to certain things, so I'll just um, can do it from there. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure uh, to be part of this uh, panel. As uh, Claudia and Philippe uh, mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk about the empirical uh, side of issue uh, to get a better understanding of capital flows, international spillovers, and macroprudential policy. Um, let me uh, start uh, with, uh, you know, what is at the core of this pa panel. We all know that global financial integration can lead to a buildup of systemic risk uh, within the financial system. And this uh, within the financial system is, is a broad concept. It is, it, you can think this as within the global financial system, within the domestic financial system, and within the financial system of a certain region like Europe. And uh, the key uh, issue here is this happens because of the procyclical nature of the capital flows. So what I would like to focus on uh, three uh, questions uh, under this uh, statement. First is what are the effects of this process uh, on uh, domestic country financial conditions? So when I say domestic country, think this as the country on the receiving side of capital flows. And second is if there are any differences between advanced countries and emerging markets, we have to understand uh, these differences if there are any. And then the third is what are the implications for macroprudential policy? You will see that most of my presentation is going to be on the first two, because I'm going to under argue that very, you know, similar to Philip is uh, the macroprudential policy uh, academic literature is at its infancy, and uh, you know the reason for that is actually not we haven't used macroprudential policies before or macroprudential policies weren't important before. They have been always used. In fact, by emerging markets, they have been used extensively, and they have been understood to be a very critical complement to monetary policy. This was always there, but the academics are the ones actually uh, coming behind, not the policymakers, uh, as in many cases. Uh, and the reason why academics coming behind of the policymakers is when you try to model macroprudential policy, you can only model as a second best. And as you know, in academic literature, uh, there is a theory bias, and you know we like to model things as optimal first best. We don't like things as second best, but as famously put by Avinash Dixit, the real world world is at second best at best. So it is extremely important to understand uh, in that sense. Uh, so I, I celebrate this uh, literature that is its infancy and we are trying to understand theoretically as Philip already gave you a very nice overview. But why my presentation is going to focus on one and two, because uh, to understand theoretical framework, to model a theoretical framework behind the macroprudential policy and to design better macroprudential policies in the policy arena, we really have to understand first one and two. You know, how these work, what are the effects, what are the numbers, what are the quantitative impacts, you know, how, uh, you know, any, any given country can deal with this, what are the spillovers, you have to put numbers on these things. If you don't put numbers on these things, you cannot you know, design the macroprudential policy. That's going to be the key argument of my presentation. OK, so within this context, I'm going to make four points. The first point, and then relate each point to the policy implication. The first point is about gross capital inflows by sector. So we tend to look at the gross capital inflows as a package, you know, how much capital, you know, come in, in a country, out of a country. In fact, we used to look at the net concept only. Uh, now we understand that gross concept is extremely important. I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to argue that, you know, capital flows by sector is also very important. But it means is, who is the sector on the receiving side? Is capital flows coming into the banking sector? of a country, or the corporates of the country borrowing directly, or households of the country borrowing directly. This is going to be extremely important, not only from a modeling perspective, as uh, Philip argued, but also to understand the financial stability risk, to correctly assess the financial stability risk, and that's going to be the key thing when you want to design better macroprudential policies. Number two is this point that I uh, made 
In my first slide about numbers, numbers meaning aggregate impact. So most of the times we can see things, uh, okay, you know, so when I do this policy, you know, this bank does that, this firm does that, okay, great. But what is the aggregate impact in the economy? I mean, as you all know and appreciate, it is extremely hard to design macroprudential policies to complement the, you know, with monetary policy and to coordinate it across countries. So, I mean, clearly, before you know, putting that type of effort, we have to know the aggregate impact in a given country. So how important it is. And this really goes through the global financial cycle. Why? Because global financial cycle is what kind of uh, brings together the capital flows or the global level uh, together with what is going on domestically uh, in any given country that is on the receiving side of the capital flows. And to understand the aggregate impact in a country, we have to quantify the impact of global financial cycle on the financial conditions in a given country. My third point is going to be on the role of domestic banks. <clears throat> we already have a lot of work thanks to uh, pioneering work by Claudia and Linda uh, through the IBRN network on the role of global banks, foreign banks. We know they are very important, but I'm going to argue that domestic banks are also going to be very important. Domestic bank meaning, you know, the bank operate domestically, doesn't own by any big global banking network or doesn't have any foreign ownership, but has a big role, it's a large bank, has a big role in terms of domestic credit expansion. And I'm going to argue that heterogeneity in this domestic financial intermediation is going to be extremely important because that uh, interacts with capital flows, global financial cycle, in a way that transmits the uh, conditions. So this is going to be the key to international spillovers, and that's going to be important to understand, especially the quantitative role of this heterogeneity uh, to understand, to design better macroprudential policies. And the fourth point is going to be uh, in terms of this foreign currency borrowing. As Philip already mentioned, this is something that is more relevant for emerging markets. That's correct, but I believe it's also relevant to a certain extent uh, to the European countries and to certain advanced countries like New Zealand and Australia. Uh, and it's, there's something important here. So generally how we think this foreign currency borrowing is, uh, well, it is cheaper to borrow in foreign currency, right? I mean, you go and, you know, look at any emerging market you want, you, you know, look at, ask their forms, their banks, and you see a huge price differential. So this is, of, of course, a very, very big failure of the UIP, uncovered interest parity condition. Uh, this is something we already know, it's cheaper, and then they just, uh, you know, they are short term, they don't think the risks in the future, you know, they don't hedge and all that. So that's kind of the standard argument. What we were missing is actually this is cyclical. The, the, the interest rate differential between borrowing in foreign currency and the local currency, that differential increases and decreases cyclically moving together with the global financial cycle, with the capital flows. And that's going to be extremely important because that means you can switch between borrowing more in foreign currency or borrowing more in local currency as a function of global financial cycle that immediately connects the whole system together and makes uh, the role of capital flows very important. So, and this is going to be actually a risk that we overlook so far, which is again going, should be uh, part of the uh, macroprudential design. All right, let me detail my point. So what I'm going to show you first is uh, these capital flows by sector. So the way this slide is organized is the top row is going to be advanced economies, the bottom row is going to be emerging markets. Let me just start with the headline statistics. This is going to be actually a big uh, panel. There are going to be over 80 countries here, advanced and emerging. And the headline statistics I want you to take away first is when you look at the external borrowing of the countries, with all the effort we put to make it more FDI, more equity, it is still not it, okay? So on average, the, the bulk of the external borrowing of a given country on average over time is going to be mostly debt, okay? 60% of the external borrowing is going to be debt. And when you look at this debt, 70% of this debt is going to through bank loans. Okay, all these arguments, FDI increase, corporate bond issues increase, sovereign bond, correct, but that's not going to be the bulk, okay? So in that sense, banks are going to be, have a very important role in intermediating capital flows globally. Yes, non-banks are also important. Yes, you know, the bond markets are important, but the lion's share is still going to go to banks. And this is going to be important when we think these things in an international context. Now, as I said, 70% of the whole debt is going to be bank loans, and of course, the 30% is going to be bonds. Now, when you, of course, this is an average, uh, you know, uh, figure. When we go to the details uh, of the advanced and emerging, 
So the, my, my pointer is not working, but I'm going to point you uh, to the right graph. So as I said, top row is advanced economies. The first little figure is the debt in advanced economies, and each line is a sector. Okay, the red is the bank, blue is the corporate, uh, green is the sovereign, and purple is the central bank. So what you are seeing is, and this is over time, since 1995 uh, till today, and what you see is, uh, you know, overall in terms of levels, more than 60% of capital inflows coming into advanced economies is coming to the banking sector. Okay, the rest is coming to sovereign sector and the corporate sector as shown by blue and the green. Yes, there is a declining trend, uh, but you know, not that strong. Now, within that debt, again, we are still in the first row, the middle uh, little uh, figure, that shows the OID. OID is in the balance of payment jargon is other investment debt. Other investment debt is mostly loans. Okay, and the last one is PD, portfolio debt, which is going to be mostly bonds. Now, again, in the emerging market, uh, sorry, advanced economy context, as you see the, the top line is red, that means most of the uh, loan-based investment, again, coming into the banking sector, this is capital inflows, and only around 20% coming into the corporate and less than that to the sovereign. Now, the last figure for advanced economies, portfolio debt, this is, when you look at bonds, this is, actually equal, right? Why? Because, of course, advanced countries have more developed bond markets. So here, it is kind of a third, third, third. 30% is coming into the corporate sector. Corporate sector borrow in terms of bond issues externally. You know, sovereigns issues bond externally, and banks also issues bond external. So that's kind of... Uh, Equal shares. You move to emerging markets, you say drastic difference, okay? In terms of debt overall, actually, the banking sector, corporate sector, and the sovereign sector in emerging markets have equal shares, right? They externally borrow 30, 30, 30. Okay, when you look, look at this loan versus bond composition in terms of loans, which is the, uh, the bottom middle uh, graph, you see that the red line and the blue line is on top of each other. What does it mean? In emerging markets, you know, there are kind of 30, 40% shares. In emerging markets, banking sector borrowing a lot in terms of loans. That means domestic banks borrowing from foreign banks. This is the cross-border loans. And uh, Claudio's work uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, really really bring this uh, data to the forefront through IBRN. And the green line, the sovereigns, the government sector of the uh, uh, emerging markets, that's less than 20%. Okay. Now, when you look at the bonds, you see a huge difference. This is the last uh, column and the last uh, figure in the, in the bottom. You see a huge difference between emerging markets and advanced countries. In terms of bonds, portfolio debt, emerging markets, corporates, and banks are not that active. Why? Because obviously, you know, these, you really have to be a big bank, a big corporate to be able to go out and issue a bond outside, right? We always hear these like Petrobras, you know, stories and all that, but how many firms are like that in emerging markets? Not that many. And that's going to come back to the aggregate impact. That's going to come back how the macro prudential uh, policy has to be told. You see, when you think in terms of the bonds, the lion's share goes to the sword. Okay, emerging market sovereigns are still the ones who issue the, uh, the bond outside and who borrow in terms of that. So this again gives you the important role of banks for emerging markets, which you can say, well, we already knew that, but banks are also going to have an important role for advanced countries. This is, this is in terms of all external, everything is externally, right? We are trying to understand how capital uh, flowing into what sector. Okay, we can use this data and do a very simple regression to understand the role of the fundamentals versus global factors. So in terms of the capital flows, actually, this is very important. When we understand the spillover relate to capital flows to the domestic financial conditions, we first have to understand if capital flows coming to fun because of the fundamentals. What does it mean? The country is doing good things, country is growing, policies are right, and so forth, and that's going to be captured by GDP growth. So this is going to be a regression of capital flows, as you see on the left-hand side, flow to GDP ratio, capital flows the of GDP, those little I's and T's means country and time, at the country time level, I is the country. So we are going to regress that on the country's own GDP growth. So this is supposed to capture, you know, I'm a growing country, I'm doing things right, obviously foreign investors want to come and invest in my country. The other factor, as you see, is going to be the VIX. This is uh, now, uh, you know, pretty much the consensus uh, common global common factor. Obviously, we owe this to the very influential research by Helen Ray, uh, and then others follow the Helen's research. We, we know that VIX is an important uh, global common factor. Although it is a stock market volatility index, 
you know, belongs to the U.S. because it, it relates to the U.S. monetary policy. It is a global uh, common factor in terms of uh, telling us how capital flows globally moving and how it's allocated. So I'm going to take it as a proxy for the supply side of capital flows. So this regression meant to capture capital flows coming into a country on average because of demand factors, because country is doing something good, country fundamental, GDP growth, and because of supply factors, meaning the foreign investors' perception, you know, low interest rates in advanced countries pushing them to emerging markets or vice versa, risky situation in emerging markets pushing them to advanced countries and so forth. So that global financial conditions, global common factor is going to be picked up by this. What you see in this table is, again, the top is advanced economies, the bottom is emerging markets. The first uh, column is just what you would do the first, total capital flows, right? When you regress total capital flows on VIX and GDP growth, you actually get exactly the same result in advanced economies and emerging markets. That first uh, column tells you, look, when GDP growth is up, you know, during booms, countries are doing good things, both advanced economies and emerging markets, they do receive capital flows, a positive coefficient. And there's a negative coefficient on VIX that says when global financial conditions are tight, when there's a lot of uncertainty globally, think 2007, 8, 9 crisis, then actually capital retracts generally from everywhere on average. Okay, it's a negative coefficient, capital flows down. Now, the interesting pattern here is when you separate these into sectors, so the sovereigns, banks, and corporates, every column after the first column, the difference, let me just summarize so you don't need to go through every number, but the big uh, difference here is, oh, now my, my pointer is not working. The big difference is the, the banks and the corporates, so this is the private sector, right? The private capital flows, both in advanced economies and in emerging markets, reacts negatively to VIX. That means low VIX, good con global financial conditions, you know, banks and corporates, private sector receive capital inflows, both in emerging countries and advanced, country, advanced economies, okay? Uh, but in terms of growth, there is actually a difference. In emerging markets, when emerging markets do things right, when they demand capital flows, sorry, they actually do receive capital flows. This is a positive coefficient. But their public sector, their sovereign, moves uh, counter-cyclically. And this is extremely very important because once you get into these arguments of like global savings cloud, you know, you know, is the China saving a lot and that's really coming to the US, you know, Philip mentioned this, we really have to understand this difference between public and private sector because as you see, that's clearly, you know, Chinese government and not the Chinese private sector, okay? So this, this is going to be important because our models are not modeling the government sector. Our models are about modeling the private sector. Okay, and in terms of, uh, you know, advanced economies, you know, when the things are good, as you see, capital flows coming to the banking sector and the banking sector intermediates the capital flows. Okay, yeah, let me just, oh, sorry, okay, let me just be a little bit quick. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to go very quickly on the different views on the importance of the global financial cycle because this is, this shows you this kind of the role of VIX and then how it relates to the spillovers. Now, the, the, as I said, the, the, the leading view on this is global financial cycle is extremely important. This is uh, first shown by Helen Ray at, Jackson, at her Jackson Hole uh, uh, paper and then by BIS uh, uh, work by Claudio Bori and Owen Shin. And then they are going to argue that there's a key role of VIX and U.S. monetary policy in global bank's leverage and international capital flows. And this is going to imply, as Philip said, maybe we should think about capital controls and limiting capital mobility, although their conclusion is not just for emerging market, for everyone. Now, Claudio's work with Linda actually says it depends because we have to look at the granular data and maybe the cross-border transmission through banks is very strong and that will go with the data I already show you, but maybe into non-bank lending, into firms and households, private sector, there might be a limited role. And there is also another uh, line of research that says, you know, maybe global financial cycle and the capital flow role in terms of domestic financial conditions is not that important because exchange rates are going to insulate this. The questions that are open here are still, you know, how are the domestic credit conditions are affected and how can we quantify this because the policy the, is going to respond, both the macro prudential policy and the monetary policy. Okay. And here the problem in the empirical research is first it uses cross-country capital flows and I already argued that it's important to go more granular to the sector. And I'm going to argue next is actually it's, you have to go even more granular to big data as was argued by uh, Governor Drag yesterday, today by Francesco. And also cross-border activity of global banks is not going to be enough because you are going to be missing all this domestic uh, policy response and domestic action. Same problem with the VARs, you know, OLS regressions or the VARs cannot deal with endogeneity of flows 
or the policy response, right? I mean, the policy makers, makers neither in emerging markets nor advanced economies, especially the countries that receive a lot of capital flows, they are not just going to sit and wait and do nothing. They are going to respond both ex ante and ex post. And you know, it's hard for our existing techniques to take this into account. And then this is going to be very important because if we want to design the right micro potential, we have to detect the effect on domestic loan growth and the real effects of spillovers, not just in the financial sector, but in the real sector. Okay. So I'm going to focus like uh, two pieces of uh, research to give you these numbers that focus on emerging markets. Why is that? Because emerging markets always have this problem. Business cycles, credit cycles, and capital flows always correlated in emerging markets. And most of the time, these end up in financial crisis, which is why there have been many, many different macroprudential policies employed by the emerging markets. And uh, uh, you know, because policymakers, they're always told capital flows is a financial step of the risk, and monetary policy is not enough. They have to complement monetary policy with uh, macroprudential policy. So it's a good laboratory to understand the causal effect, mechanism, and the magnitudes. So can we justify the response of the policymakers? OK, the findings are going to tell you that these supply side capital flows are very important. So the global financial cycle is going to be important. The numbers are such that you can have up to one percentage point reduction in borrowing costs. And you can explain 43% of the actual aggregate, aggregate credit growth by the uh, exogenous uh, capital flows. Bank heterogeneity is extremely going to be, is going to be extremely important, and domestic banks. So the procyclical agent in the system is going to be domestic banks. But which domestic banks? The large international connected domestic banks. These borrow in the international interbank market and then bring that money and intermediate. And they are going to be responsible of most of these 43% uh, effect of capital flows on the corporate sector credit growth. Uh, foreign currency borrowing is going to be cheaper on average, but during these risk on periods where foreign investors want to invest in emerging markets, actually local currency borrowing is going to be relatively cheaper, which means you have these huge credit booms up to 40, 45% of GDP that is also coming from new locals entering the market. So this is an extremely important dimension of this, generally missed because there is this super emphasis on the foreign currency borrowing. It always sounds like it's always about foreign currency borrowing. No, local currency borrowing is extremely also important. And risky firms finance borrowing at lower interest rate and not necessarily their overborrow. This is very important because, because this is for deviate from the models that Philip mentioned. The models always think, oh, there is going to be this overborrowing something because an externality, collateral constraint, you're like, why? Because these models are written with the advanced country context. Although they are for open economy, they think capital flows coming directly to the real estate, directly to the land, directly to the assets, increasing the asset values, that relaxes the collateral constraint, and that externality is going to create all this. Well, if the capital flows coming to the banking sector, borrowing costs is actually actually equally important, even maybe more important uh, than these type of arguments where you really need granular big data to show these things. And this is what this research does. This uses big, big data, loan data, over 100 million loans uh, from several countries. This one, particularly from Turkey, that shows you the result in a picture. This is the QE period in the US in the gray uh, blocks, and the VIX in the black line, and the borrowing cost, both real and nominal borrowing cost at the granular, at the micro firm level in red and blue. That shows you how this moves with the VIX, which means borrowing cost with, moves with the capital flows. And that correlation gets tighter and tighter when the interest rates are really low in advanced countries, captured here with the QE episode. And it's important why, because uh, this is a picture from Turkey, uh, but I'm going to show you a general picture from emerging markets too. The emerging markets, banks, uh, firms, and households don't borrow externally that much, right? And this shows the bank's external borrowing. That is the black line. That goes up to 40% of GDP. Domestic banks borrow externally, but domestic corporates, all in the other axis with the blue line, red line, and the purple line, these direct borrowing or corporates is very, very small as a function of uh, aggregate GDP, less than one. Person. Not specific to Turkey, all emerging markets do that. As you see, this is the credit share you know, circulated by domestic banks to households and firms in these, all these emerging markets. O overwhelming proportion is by domestic banks, not direct external borrow. OK, so my last slide on the implication for microprudential policy is, as I said, the literature is mostly theoretical, very little evidence. We really need evidence from the big data. And that evidence so far is saying, actually, it is maybe better to focus on lenders in emerging markets. But advanced countries, as Philip 
have mentioned, households and firms focusing on borrowers is also important. It's very important to understand who is the procyclical agent, who is the procyclical sector in a given economy, and the evidence so far is saying actually, you know, it's not really through this external and collateral concept, but it is through borrowing costs. And this is also mentioned in the latest ESRB uh, publication that, you know, so much is on the banks and we don't have that much on the non-banks and we need to do more work on that, but the more work on that requires us to understand these mechanisms and the quantitative impacts. Okay, thank you thank very you much. Thank you very much, Shatnam, for a lot of information, a lot of empirical results, yes. also comparing the advanced economies and the emerging markets, and I think the IMF is also constantly thinking about vol volatilities, at least in emerging markets, as we are seeing some of them now, seems to be rather idiosyncratic, but we never know. And um, so Jeffrey Franks will, will um, thank you. give us that perspective. So I, I think my remarks today will be very complimentary with the presentations that we've just heard about because, uh, uh, as you can expect, we were very focused on policies and I will concentrate on, on advanced, uh, advanced economies, in particular on European economies in my remarks. Um, I would uh, like to also say that uh, uh, my, uh, my boss, Paul Thompson, uh, was scheduled to speak here and he, he sends his apologies and his greetings. Um, the focus of my remarks today will be on the role of macroprudential policies in maintaining financial stability in advanced economies. I'll draw on the work of the IMF uh, in Europe and other selected advanced uh, countries to try to glean some lessons from what we've seen in practice uh, with macroprudential macro policy. In this regard, I will also illustrate the role of a range of other policies like tax policy, housing finance, and restrictions on land supply that have a strong bearing on the underlying issues that macroprudential policies typically seek to address. But first, since we're here at the ECB, uh, a brief word on monetary policy to provide some context to the discussion. As I'm sure you all know, the IMF is uh, very supportive of the ECB's current strong accommodation policy, which we think should be maintained until inflation is convinci convincingly converging to its objective. And as net purchases, asset purchases draw to a close, clear forward guidance is going to be even more important. But there are questions uh, that have been raised in some circles about whether this strongly accommodative monetary policy has caused financial instability. Uh, let me say that uh, our research in the fund does not does suggest that that is not so. We see no generalized financial stability concerns at the current juncture. To be sure, we find that there are some localized pockets of excess. For instance, there are a few euro area countries where house prices are above historical metrics, and in some others where they are growing in double digits. And in a few countries, corporate debt relative to GDP is also rising fast. But importantly, these cases are the exception and not the rule. Of course, there are many other markets aside from housing and equity and country level indicators may be masking some localized bubbles. Uh, there is no doubt that policymakers need to remain vigilant to ensure that financial stability risks do not begin to take root. This brings me to the, the main focus of my remarks on macroprudential policies to reduce systemic risk. As you know, compared to monetary policy, which is only available at the euro-wide Euro area wide level, macroprudential policies can, in principle, closely target risks in specific national markets, thereby contributing to reducing the heterogeneity in financial and business cycles across Euro area member states. This is an area where rem remarkable progress has been made in recent years. We have the European Systemic Risk Board, a European institution that can warn both countries and EU institutions if risks are increasing. Moreover, more Moreover, macroprudential authorities are now operational in every member state. And in the euro area, if deemed necessary, the capital-based macroprudential tools can be topped up by the ECB, which uh, also has macroprudential responsibilities in addition to its microprudential role. This being said, our view is that the EU macroprudential framework would benefit from some simplification. Procedures to activate macroprudential instruments are complex, involving many authorities at different levels. A few countries, Austria, Belgium, Finland, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, were alerted by the ESRB in November 2016 about potential overvaluation in their housing markets and rising household indebtedness. In Austria and Luxembourg, even though legislation for borrower-based 
tools was introduced, th these are yet to be fully used. And in some cases, the activation of capital-based tools took over a year. Let me give you the example of Finland to illustrate this. In response to the ESRB's November 2016 warning on rising household and didn't household indebtedness, the macroprudential authority in Finland, Fin F uh, FSA, decided to introduce a bank-specific risk weight uh, floor of 15% for residential real estate mortgage loans. The first step in this process was to consult the ECB on the appropriateness and adequacy of the measure. After the ECB signed off on it, Fin FSA started the formal notification process in, in June 2017 with the European Banking Authority and the ESRB. This part of the process ended in the first week of August of 2017, after both the EBA and the ESRB gave favorable opinions. Next, the measure went to the European Commission, which gave it its no objection in the third week of August. It, had, it also decided not to send it up to the Council. If the Council had been required to give its no objection as well, the process would have been longer and could have entered a, a political process. The measure was activated on January 3, 2018 for one year. If Finn FSA wants to extend it for another year, it needs to go through that same process again. The recently completed uh, Euro Area FSAP from the IMF suggested that this process could, should be simplified to provide country authorities with better ability to act in a timely manner. One option would be to enable country authorities to act once the EBA and the ESRB have given their favorable favorable opinion, which should take no more than two months. This would avoid the possibility also of a, some politicization of the process with the measure going to the EC and the Council. Let me move on. As you know, there's a lively debate on the effectiveness of macroprudential measures. Many skeptics argue that they remain untested and that we are in uncharted territory. We've heard that there's an inconclusive uh, uh, academic literature on the theoretical side in this respect. Um, there is also evidence that macroprudential uh, measures are subject to linkages. We've discussed that both yesterday and, and this morning. And that, they, and that they also may become less effective over time due to those linkages as credit shifts to alternative sources. Um, what is our view in the IMF? Our analysis shows that macroprudential measures targeted towards specific risks work better than instruments that target broad area-wide concerns. But this also means that the toolkit needs to include specific tools legislated well in advance so that they can be used when needed. In view of this, it is somewhat problematic that some Euro area countries have not yet legislated a full set of borrower-based tools. These countries include Belgium, Germany, Greece, Italy, Malta, Portugal, and Spain. The measures are well known. Borrower-based caps on loan-to-value and debt service-to-income ratios. These are best suited to address specific risks for all institutions, domestic banks, foreign branches, non-bank financial institutions, so the possibility of leakage is relatively low. Ideally, all countries should legislate borrower-based tools with harmonized definitions. Moreover, macroprudential authorities should be able to tighten these tools for all lending institutions, and they should be applicable to both households and to corporates. Let me comment on these two groups of borrowers. First, focusing on macroprudential policies to address housing concerns. One of our key findings in this regard is that the underlying issues fueling housing market booms are typically much wider and cannot be addressed by macroprudential policies on their own. For, is, for example, supply constraints often play a role in housing cycles as demographics, urbanization, and income trends outpace construction. Thus, at least in principle, policies to help this, make the supply of housing more elastic could help. But the case of Spain is, is cautionary. Here, when more uh, development land was made available, it did not contain the property boom. In these more difficult cases, even more fundamental steps may be needed. They may include tax measures to eliminate biases in favor of ownership and in favor of debt. This points to the importance of ensuring that macroprudential authorities 
uh, are able to coordinate with fiscal and other authorities, not least on tax and zoning restrictions that could be distorting property prices. Let me briefly touch on measures that some countries have introduced to deter speculation by investors, such as higher transaction taxes for non-primary residences. Prominent examples here include Australia and Canada. This has been a subject of much debate in and outside of the, of the IMF, and not least because in the IMF's so-called institutional view, measures that differentiate between residents and non-residents are classified as capital flow management measures. And that triggers a certain mechanisms and processes inside the, inside the IMF. The case for applying measures specifically aimed at foreign buyers is not clear cut. On the, on the one hand, foreign buyers could be paying in cash or borrowing from foreign financial institutions, which would not increase the local financial stability risks. On the other hand, increasing house prices could make it more expensive for first-time buyers. There are also adverse consequences of fouling house prices in the, on the local market when a real estate boom busts. While there are reasons to be concerned about the participation of foreign buyers in local housing markets, it should be noted that some of the same issues may apply to other buyers. Uh, such as domestic speculative investors. Recent uh, IMF research on this issue for Canada shows that non-resident home buyers represent only a small fraction of existing housing stock in uh, places that have been subject to big booms uh, in the real estate prices like Vancouver and Toronto. To the extent that speculators are found to be driving excessive house price inflation and raising house, housing affordability concerns, targeting property transfer taxes on all speculative home buyers is a more effective solution than measures aim solely at non-resident home buyers. This is the, this is the um, practice that has been followed in Hong Kong and in the UK, where buyers of a second home for investment purposes, irrespective of nationality, face higher stamp duties. In contrast, Australia has only applied stamp, higher stamp duties to foreign buyers, and recent IMF research has questioned such policies, given the marginal contribution such buyers have in the speculative demand for housing in Australia. Another uh, lesson regarding housing is that macroprudential policy should focus on the resilience of households and banks rather than targeting housing prices. The IMF's recent research in this regard shows that macroprudential measures usually have a lasting moderating effect on the level of household debt, but only a transitory impact on the level of housing prices. This is also very much in line with the recent experience of Sweden, where amortization requirements and loan-to-value requirements curbed credit growth but had less of an impact on housing prices. Finally on housing, I would also note that this discussion points to the need for national-level implementation of at least some macroprudential instruments. This is indeed the current setup in Europe. Some observers have argued that macroprudential policies are becoming overly fragmented and need to be consolidated at the central level. But we would suggest caution. There are some good reasons for making sure that some controls are local since they interact in so many ways with various features of the real economy, such as housing markets, zoning, and taxation issues. Besides, local macroprudential authorities can oversee both bank and non-bank financial intermediaries, which are important targets for borrower-based tools. And there is also the asymmetric information aspect to consider. Local regula re regulators have information about local conditions and complex, complex interactions that the center may not have. This does not, of course, mean that the center does not need to pay a play a coordinating role to address inaction bias by local regulators and cross-border spillovers and leakages. So finally, let me turn to the issue of corporate credit. Tools targeting corporate credit need careful design. In the euro area, only half of corporate loans come from banks. The rest come from non-bank financial sources, including shadow banks for which data is scarce, and from other corporates. Moreover, the corporate sector, of course, can access the bond market and still increase its indebtedness. Thus, there is considerable, considerable potential for leakages that risk rendering 
the macroprudential tools ineffective. France is a recent example where macroprudential measures were introduced to dampen corporate credit growth. In view of rising corporate debt, the French macroprudential authority has tightened the large exposure limit in, in big French banks for loans to highly indebted large non-financial corporations. Such measures will protect the banking, center, uh, the banking sector against corporate defaults, if any. At the same time, the counter-cyclical capital buffer requirement on overall credit was increased from 0 to 0.25 percent in view of the rising private sector indebtedness in France. As with housing, macroprudential tools to target corporate credit need to be supplemented by other measures. For instance, the tax deductibility of interest payments in most co corporate income tax systems, coupled with no such deductibility for equity financing, creates economic distortions and exacerbates leverage. One way to mitigate this debt bias is to provide a deduction for equity costs. Recent IMF work looked at the effect of the Belgian allowance for corporate equity, a tax and incentive to raise equity finance on corporate debt ratios in non-financial firms and banks relative to a control group of similar com companies in other countries. It finds that the impact of the Belgian legislation is significant and large, and the debt ratio in Belgium is almost 20 percentage points lower than in the control group of non-financial firms and almost 14 percentage points lower than in the control group for banks. Of course, while such tax measures can be very effective, they need to be carefully designed to address concerns about revenue costs and the potential for tax avoidance. In some cases, rising corporate indebtedness is account accompanied by increasing prices in commercial real estate. While bank loans can fuel such price spirals like in Ireland before the global financial crisis, tightening loan-to-value loan to or debt service-to-income ratios for corporate collateralized borrowing from all financial entities may work better. Here, too, coordination with fiscal authorities is key, as changes in tax and depreciation rules could spur commercial real estate booms and busts, as the experience of the United States in the 1980s shows. I would urge that EU authorities close data gaps as well in commercial real estate prices to help facilitate uh, regulation in this area. Let me just conclude now. Uh, I want to conclude with three essential points here. First, in the euro area, common monetary policy makes macroprudential tools even more important than in other jurisdictions. Because of still significant fragmentation, member states will often be at different stages of economic and financial cycles, and the extent of financial excesses will therefore vary across countries. This points to the critical importance of macroprudential policies. Second. The good news is that the framework that has been set up in the EU is a remarkable achievement. It could benefit from some simplification, as I illustrated earlier, but Europe has come a long way. At the same time, not all countries have yet legislated the borrower-based tools with harmonized definitions that are best suited to target specific risks and limit damages. And third. <coughs> Our experience in the IMF suggests that the problems of that, that the problems that macroprudential policy seeks to address are often caused by other real sector factors and by distortions in other policy areas. So macroprudential policies cannot be a substitute for addressing those underlying problems. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, a very um, rich policy perspective on the on the issue. I, I have one question, which is two part, and it's a, it's a broad one, which I would give to the, like to give to the panel, and then I um, op would open up the floor for discussion. So. One of the aspects that uh, you all implicitly touched upon, but not very explicitly, is the question, when should macroprudential policy act? And um, uh, so to what extent is it a forward-looking measure which is trying to identify risks along the way? Um, or to what extent is this, is this crisis management? To give my per perception, it's, it, it should be rather forward-looking. Um, so and, and it's not a crisis management um, tool in the strict sense of the word. And that. A related aspect to, 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 to that is, if it's really forward-looking, how um, how targeted should it be? So you said at the end, Jeff, that um, the, the the very targeted measures are the more effective ones. And but can we actually, if we if we see risks along the the way in terms of um, 
low interest rates that have led to distorted asset prices, how, how specific can we actually be? And wouldn't it also be a co contradiction in terms to say, well, we have to be very specific if then we address macro risks. So this was a bit what Philippe said at the beginning. Maybe we should be targeting different sectors and, and, and different, different um, uh, types of activity. So these two issues, I think they're a bit related. So how forward-looking should we be and how targeted can we, can we be and, and how, well, how good will our this description of the underlying risks actually be. So um, pick whatever you want of that, <laughs> of that broad question. And maybe Philippe would start, and then um, I would um, ask Chapman and then Jeff. OK, uh, so I think I will uh, fo focus on the, on the first point about forward looking uh, or not. I think uh, um, I was a bit uh, confused myself. Uh, so, I'm, uh, so I live in Switzerland, and in Switzerland, they uh, introduced these uh, uh, counter cyclical buffers, uh, saying that, oh, this will help uh, reducing uh, credit and uh, real estate credit and real estate prices, and, and uh, this would be uh, very, very effective. And uh, so I had, this, uh, I had the, the, this in mind, but then I realized, and based on, on the, the reading, discussions, etc., et that uh, um, well, this may not be uh, the uh, so 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 effective, and actually this is not proved so so so, so effective. So that uh, indeed initially this idea of uh, these uh, policies was more about could say controlling uh, aggregate credit, managing uh, the, the economy. Now you even said, oh, in the monetary union, this could be useful as a complementary tool because some countries may be uh, in different uh, parts of the, of the cycle. Uh, so there's this idea of macro proof could, could help. So that's uh, what actually also macro, some many models have, have uh, incorporated. But, but now I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, the evidence uh, does, is not very, very supportive. So it's more about, uh, about this forward-looking uh, aspect. Philip Lane was very uh, clear about that, that uh, counter-cyclical buffers are, are very useful for f safety of future, uh, uh, facing future crises, safety of, of, of banks for future uh, crises. So I think well, it's not yet uh, black and white, uh, yes and no, but uh, this uh, macro management effect of macro pro may have been o maybe overstated in the, in the literature, but I'd like to know a little bit more uh, empirical evidence, uh, something that uh, uh, I, I still have my doubts. Um, uh, okay, I fully agree with you. I think they should be uh, forward-looking. Uh, crisis management is a total different uh, beast, I think, and uh, and this is the essential uh, thing when we think about uh, lower interest rate asset prices, you know, the credit management and all that, because during the crisis, uh, you, you have to do monetary policy. I mean, this is, as you know, Jeremy Stein famous to put it, nothing is like interest rate that goes through all the cracks, right? And that becomes important during crisis, crisis management. So um, macro Prue is supposed to uh, be prudential, really deal with the boom period, uh, aggregate credit growth, excessive leverage, and all that. So that should be definitely, um, in that sense, forward looking. But, but then, how targeted? Uh, your second question. Uh, this is actually important and sensitive because it is. We do want to somehow curb excessive leverage and credit growth, right? Uh, Governor Lane was mentioning this yesterday too. But then, uh, where is the line between slowing down aggregate credit growth and aggregate demand management? Actually, this is exactly what I don't like with this theoretical literature because depending on the externality, it can be aggregate demand management or not. And if you look at the IMF critique on emerging markets, they criticize emerging markets that they're saying you use the these tools as aggregate demand management, and you cannot, right? But then, if you criticize the emerging markets and not the Switzerland, that, then that's not good, right? That's this whole problem behind the institutional view and everything. So we have to be very careful. That's why this, the, the sectoral dimension is extremely important. Where is the excessive leverage? Who is the pro-cyclical agent in the economy? And that's really, I think, what this session is about, because when we think this internationally, the link is capital flows, right? And then uh, I, I think we have to be very careful. I, I fully agree that, you 
you know, the aim here is uh, to curb the excessive leverage and slow down the credit growth, but, uh, you know, they can't be used as aggregate demand management tools. So because then, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's an issue. And BIS has been pushing this a lot because once you get out of this more uh, strong institution, advanced country setting to emerging markets, then who is the authority who is in charge of it, right? Is that authority politically independent? You know, then we have all sorts of questions. So it's important, um, this targeted question is extremely important, yeah, but they should be forward looking. So I, I think it's unanimous that forward looking is the way to go here. Um, you know, I, I, I think of it very much as uh, a complementary tool to monetary policy itself. And we, do, we would never argue for monetary policy to be sort of only in the moment. We always have to be looking forward. And I think you need to do the same thing with your, with your macroprudential policy. Um, on this issue of, of targeting, uh, I, I guess the way I would I would look at this issue is to think about having we have we we should have a toolkit that has a full spectrum of tools that range from the most macro to the most micro, and we should be using the right tool for the problem that we are facing. So we should have this ability to sort of move down from more macro to more micro policies. This might mean something of you know you could ask yourself the question in a country like Canada where there's a huge real estate boom in in Vancouver and in Toronto, but not in the rest of the country, is there some regional specific policies that could help deal with this? And, and I, would, I would also echo the caution in my, in my opening remarks that we, we can't fix problems with macro pru that weren't caused by macro pru. I mean, if we could just harken back, for example, to the, to the, to the, the problems that led up to the great financial crisis in the United States. You know, at, we all remember when Alan Greenspan came out and said, it's not the job of monetary policy to deal with the housing boom. He was actually right. But what he should have been doing is applying macroprudential policies. And then we also know that that financial crisis was not just a macroprudential problem. It was a problem with regulatory framework. It was a problem with oversight. It was a problem that you know, had many, many layers to it. Macro pru would have helped, but it wouldn't fix the problem by itself. Okay, thank you. So we agree that it should be forward looking, but then the question is, of course, what's the right time to activate in particular when it goes to the counter cyclical measures? And that, that I think is a debate that we're having right now. And I think it, my personal view is it will always be difficult to exactly pinpoint and to define the excessiveness that we have in credit. When and does there, it become a other. bubble, right? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but that, that will be important also at some point. Um, of course, also for the for the IMF because it immediately raises what are the buffers in the private sector before we have to resort to public um, safety nets. Uh, but let me open the floor for um, for comments and uh, yes, please. We we'll start over there. Mm -hmm. um, let's assume that you have price stability. The budget deficit is pretty low but you have a rising external imbalance. And you are an emerging economy. What's been missing in the debate, in my view, is the size of the economy and, and the role played by reserve money providers, the key central banks. It's not a level playing field and all economies are equal and so on and so on. But, but let, me, let, let me continue with. So you have a rising imbalance, external imbalance. And the panelists here are, they say, we don't know about uh, managing aggregate demand. But if monetary policy is not effective, the budget if is pretty low. You might even have a budget surplus. And you have a rising external imbalance because of the private sector overborrowing. What do you do? I mean, and you know at the end of the day, the crash is going to, ha to happen. The downturn is going to come. What do you do? I mean, macroprudential policy is the main, the main tool in the circumstances. You have to do it. So it's not like we are, it's like we are ticking around the fringes. Whether we should use it, it's because aggregate demand, we should use only monetary. Let me give me a break. What can you do with monetary policy under the circumstances? And this is a key issue, and you have to do it, clearly. I mean, I'll, I will ask you very pointedly, in the case of Turkey, yep. there has been enormous overbearing. Another issue for debate is the extent of dollarization, of eurization. What do you do? Well, you have you, the banking sectors in Central and Eastern Europe are heavily dominated by foreign groups. What can you do in that? And, and this is why macroprudential 
uh, uh, policy coordination is essential. If you don't have host and home country regulators seeing eye to eye, I mean, we're going to continue with, with boom and bust dynamics. And, and, and finally, you know, I think one should distinguish between a normal global financial cycle and a drifted one. And here comes the responsibility of the reserve money centers. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, please, over here. You may want to identify yourself so that... Uh, uh, oh, the Romanian Central Bank, yes. Daniel Toyana. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm Mark Knudson from the Central Bank of Iceland. So, this is a question about, so the, what is the envelope of macro pro on the one, one hand and capital controls on the others? In, because uh, at least the two p first panelists rightly pointed out that in emerging market countries, and I argue it, it doesn't only apply to emerging market countries, it also applies to many small advanced uh, economies like my, my own and others, um, um, uh, dealing with capital flows in some sense uh, with direct tools can be needed on occasions if you are going to preserve financial stability. Um, so if that is the case, uh, wouldn't the so-called capital flow management tools be part of the macroprudential toolkit? And uh, uh, I will tell you a, a small anecdote on that. Uh, in Iceland, we have a special research requirement on capital flows coming into uh, the bond market and high yielding deposits, because we are growing much faster than other countries, much higher interest rates than the rest of the world, and, and we were being swamped by capital flows uh, into, into this due to that. Now, uh, the IMF tend to say, okay, this is capital flow management. Uh, the OECD uh, delegation says, we like this tool, you should call it macro pro, and then you're <laughs> fine. And, and so there's a question, uh, where is the borderline? I think that, uh, of course, you can't say you can deal with it differently by uh, increasing your resilience, so you can live with these capital flows and, and exchange rate fluctuations, and that is correct. But sometimes it is so much that uh, it becomes uh, very difficult. So if that is the case, uh, I'm asking the panel, so should capital flow management tools therefore be part of the macro potential toolkit? And if that is the case, you all agree that macro pro should be forward looking. Shouldn't the use of such tools also uh, be at least partly forward looking? Okay, thank you very much. We can take uh one more, let's take the gentleman up here. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to ask something which has to do with other type of leakages. I wanted to, to, to refer to a few episodes uh, which have been important for the life uh, of the Secretariat and the SRB in the last, uh, in the last months. So we have been pleading for months about introducing, for instance, a counter-cyclical margining and collateral in CCPs. And the reaction has always been, well, you cannot do it because uh, liquidity will move from, uh, from Europe uh, to New York and in the future it could go uh, to London. Uh, we have been trying to think about capital measures for insurance and the people have been telling us, well, there is not an insurance uh, global uh, capital definition. On investment funds, we have been working a lot on uh, uh, leverage, uh, on liquidity. Of course, the industry says, well, we go to, to New York and the future could be, uh, could be London. Uh, there is a bit of dismantling of the dot franc around. So, um, what you th is it possible to do macroprudential policy even for Europe? I mean, uh, we are big, but maybe we are not big enough. I saw another hand in the very back, so if you can be very brief, I will also take you in, but then we give it back to the panel. Thank you, Lubos Estak, uh, European Systemic Risk Board. Wanted to ask the question with a twist to the euro area. So given the role of capital flows in the euro area, the deeper financial integration seems to, it will bring more pro-cyclical capital flows among euro area member states. 
and what uh, macro prudential policy could do to mitigate this risk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So we have about five minutes, and uh, I, yeah, so if you <laughs> decide how you want to break it up, you don't have to um, answer all the questions, but just pick whatever you feel is, um, is, is, is most interesting. So I take it in reverse order, so Jeff would start, and Shepard okay. goes in the middle. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll jump in on this issue of, of capital flows management, because that's a very a very interesting and sensitive issue, and, and it kind of fits in with, with Daniel's point from the Romanian perspective as well. Um, you know, as you well know, we supported capital controls in Iceland during the crisis. The provocative part of your question is, should we do, do it in a forward-looking man manner? I, I would say, it depends upon what kind of policies you're looking at. There are some that I think could legitimately be considered uh, uh, macroprudential. And, and I'll refer to the Romanian case where in the run-up to the crisis, the Romanian Central Bank made a lot of efforts by putting, say, differential reserve requirements on foreign currency versus domestic currency, uh, you know, res uh, uh, had deposit requirements at the Central Bank for capital inflows. Those types of mechanisms, which have been used not just by Romania, but by Chile and other countries, I think are, are, are certainly a legitimate uh, part of the toolbox that could be used in certain circumstances. Uh, when you think about using this sort of in a forward-looking manner, I think it's a question of weighing costs and benefits. Uh, there are enormous benefits to the world economy of having relatively free capital flows, and doing it in a preemptive manner might cause more costs to the world economy. I think it almost certainly would cost more to the world economy than the benefits would, would arise. So I would say those types of actual capital type controls might be something that you have to hold only for the crisis situations and not as a standard part of your toolkit. So that would be my view on that. Okay, so uh, the question on uh, Romania and then Turkey. So, in fact, the the, the numbers I showed uh, uh, was from Turkey. Uh, let me clarify that. So, you you of course do things. What you do is you don't wait uh, that a crisis comes exactly as you say, and you these countries actually uh, deviate also from the standard IMF advice during this boom period, and they they did things, and then the, these things is a large toolkit and. Uh, uh, you know, it involves things like having different reserve requirement on foreign currency, local currency, uh, you know, interest rate corridor, uh, loan to value. I mean, th th there, there were a lot. This is exactly what I was saying. We have to, we have a lot to learn from emerging market experience because emerging markets always have to deal with this problem. They always have this policy dilemma. Every emerging market central banker knows this very well that it's not as easy as in US. You know, your monetary policy is not just a simple output gap, you know, based uh, concept. It is, there's an exchange rate concept and there's an output cap concept and the way interest rate and the exchange rate moves is exactly opposite so you know during the booms when you want to you know uh, reduce the interest rate then the exchange go the other way during the bus when you you know to, to the other way around reduce the exchange rate the exchange the exchange rate depreciation so it's very important for emerging markets that they use these things and they, they deal with this problem all the time so uh, in these these numbers I gave you 43% of the corporate sector credit is because of the capital flows, is based on all these macro prudential policies they did, all of them. So imagine the counterfactual, right? What would have done if they only did monetary policy, which is an inflation targeting framework, and did nothing? That would have been maybe 60%, 70%. The macro prudential policies also involves, you know, banning households, borrowing in foreign currency, and telling corporates only you can borrow if you're an exporter and if you borrow over a million. So there were a lot already done, and even with that, you still have this capital flow related uh, big part of your corporate uh, sector credit growth. So it is extremely important. So I guess the answer is uh, you keep doing these things. And even, you know, IMF criticized you as aggregate demand management, then, you know, you try to not use it as aggregate demand management, but use all these uh, different uh, policies, as also Jeff said, as part of the tool toolkit. So uh, this relates to the Iceland question. I fully agree that small advanced economies are exactly like emerging markets. And I would actually say Southern Europe, actually actually is very much like emerging markets. So there is, again, there is a lot to learn from emerging market experience. Now here, when you ask, then should the capital flow management and macro pro together, uh, to a certain extent, yes. But I agree with uh, Frank that it is, this is a sensitive issue. When you say capital flow management, that's a big umbrella. Capital controls is there. A lot of emerging markets actually cannot put capital controls. I mean, Turkey, for example, cannot. They are part of the you know, customs union. OECD countries cannot. So then you go to capital flow management. It's not a control. It's not a tax, but it is this different 
reserve requirements on, you know, so then, you know, how do you define things uh, becomes an issue. But the, the toolkit should be, should be large because it, this is important to do these things in a forward uh, looking uh, uh, manner. Yeah, let me stop here and then let Philip do the European questions. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, I think. Uh, no, uh, I cannot go on. But I just thought I did the emerging market questions. So. <laughs> um, no, I will, I will, I will go back to this. So, so you said you didn't, men we didn't mention this issue of like, the capital inflows problem. So of course uh, this is this is there in, in the literature. It's uh, something obvious that uh, this is the type of thing you can do with macro proof. You can uh, stabilize when you have a capital inflows problem because you cannot use your your, your monetary policy. The, the the issue I wanted to to raise is that in this context, uh, the models are just too simple and then as you mentioned you have the foreign banks you have uh, other uh, foreign investors and that's why we, we, we need to understand better uh, these these uh, these leakages uh, to uh, to understand these these uh, these macro proof. so this is totally part of, part of the story but I think that the the analysis should be more subtle than what we, we currently have and this is so this is related to the the Iceland case uh, I think here this is I would uh, frame this also with the the, the, the leakage uh, aspect. So is, there, um, is it impossible to address these issues with other types of macro proof? So if you want to uh, argue for this capital control, you should go, uh, I mean, at least conceptually, say that, no, this, there's something that we, we, we cannot do. Uh, because otherwise, it's, it's too easy. Uh, you can say, oh, well, uh, no, I, I, there are all these, these flows are just in, introduced capital controls. While, while you could have uh, uh, done maybe more, more, eff more effort in, in regulation, which is being done in the, in the other countries, so to, to uh, to ask for, for say, like uh, uh, authorization for uh, for this uh, um, capital flow management be part of macro proof. I guess uh, this is to be uh, proven that that uh, they cannot be this cannot be done uh, otherwise. But uh, other than that, I think this was my 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 uh, actually my last slide. This seems to be uh, a natural uh, a natural uh, part of of, of the, the tools because it seems for small for small countries much more difficult. So since nobody has answered the uh, question about uh, uh, Europe, question. whether it's too large or, or, or too, too small, I think we uh, that from from the academic part we, we don't know. They, they've seen a couple of papers that, that show that regulation in the UK has some peel over on, on the on the other parts but no, this is something that uh, is so so difficult uh, we don't we don't have uh, uh, evidence on, on that so this is uh, more uh, like guesses or maybe you can just uh, take take risk and see uh, uh, what, what happens so it would be then uh, interesting to have some some experiment to to, to analyze uh, but uh, that's not something we, uh, we we can we can answer so I think the question is just a bit uh, too, too, dif too difficult at least for, for but can I add something on the European you? question I, I I actually think uh, you are not I would answer that question you are not big enough right I mean this is goes also to last question it's an issue for Europe too I mean so like you know if you look at the boom period again this is because we focus so much on the crisis and then we kind of lose the sight of how important it is to understand the boom period for the crisis. So why we care about this stuff? We care about this because at the end we care about investment and productivity. And if you look at the boom period, all this Spain stuff is about capital flows from North Europe to Southern Europe. North Europe you know, running more current account surpluses, Southern Europe running current account deficit. And that money came to Spain is completely allocated to the wrong firms, right? That's still related to the domestic banking sector of the Spain. And then when you, you these allocated to the wrong firms, the investment increase but the product decline, and that contributed to the product divergence within Europe. At the end, this is why we want to do these things forward-looking, you know, why we want to curb leverage and credit growth, because we know there is going to be this effect on investment and productivity down the line. Now, how, how, how you do that? I mean, like, when you answer, okay, I'm going to do this counter-cyclical thing, and I'm going to, you know, regulate this, well, the, the, the stuff is going to move, fine, then the stuff should move, maybe. Maybe, maybe it shouldn't have flowed that much to Spain at the first place. I mean, you know, it is important to see this with, the, like, the overall Europe or overall global system and what is the domestic intermediaries are doing on place because that's going to be an important part of the story. Can I jump in there just a, a little bit too because this is really the big question, right? I, I would say a couple of things. First of all, I mean, you, the very question that you're asking it, it sort of emphasizes the fact that coordination, international coordination is absolutely critical. Uh, to the extent that certain types of, of financial activity are extremely mobile, 
then your ability to control them in any one jurisdiction is, it becomes less and less, right? The transactions costs are very low, the ability to move them is very high. Having said that, if there is a specific borrower in Europe or a lender in Europe, you have a legal way of, of addressing that issue. CCPs is a much more complicated question because the entire activity could be moved offshore. And, and so I think that we have to distinguish there. Uh, you can use borrower-based macro pro measures or, or lender-based macro pro measures as long as they're legally located in, in your territory. But once you've got those types of activities that can move with very low cost all over the world, then they're gonna end up in tax havens or they're gonna end up in New York or, or wherever, and that only coordinated action is gonna work in that case. Okay, thank you very much. Like in the real world, we get uh, conflicting signals how big our buffers are. The, the clock here says we still have a buffer, the clock up there says <laughs> we've run into the coffee break. So let's stop here. Uh, thanks a lot to the panel and lo lots of uh, food for thought for the, for the coffee break and thank you all for, for raising questions.